Your presence here today reflects your commitment to learning, sharing ideas, and fostering a collaborative environment. Mm -hmm. This workshop is being conducted under the auspices of the Roundtable on Science and Welfare in the Laboratory of Welfare in Laboratory Animal Use. And I'm honored to have such a distinguished group of experts and leaders here today to discuss the different aspects of effective communication about research that involves animals. I would like to begin by thanking our, all of our presenters for joining us today and tomorrow for what we have planned to be a truly interactive workshop and to engage in what I am sure will be lively and robust discussions. I would also like to thank each and every one of the committee members in, in working to plan this workshop. In particular, I'd like to extend my thanks to Dr. Alice Wong, our chair, and Dr. Margaret Landy, our vice chair. Before we continue, there are a couple of administrative notes. If you have a question at any point during the sessions, please use the Q&A to submit your question. We will make every effort to respond to as many questions as possible. We will answer questions during the Q&A portion scheduled at the end of each session and during the final Q&A, which is scheduled as the last session of the second day of the workshop. I'd like to thank you all for your interest and attendance today. Before we delve into the discussions ahead, it is imperative that we set the tone for a respectful and inclusive atmosphere. The National Academy stands firmly against any form of harassment, bullying, or hate speech. We believe in the power of constructive dialogue, where diverse perspectives contribute to a tapestry of ideas. It is through this diversity that we can achieve a deeper understanding of the methods of effective communication about research that requires the use of animals and cultivate an environment that encourages innovation and mutual respect. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Alice. Thank you very much, Nia. And thank you to all of the National Academy staff who've just been amazing in helping to get this um, workshop together. Um, to start, I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, what the goal of the workshop is, and that is to provide scientists with information and tools for communicating more effectively with the general public on topics that are important to understanding what scientific research with animals involves and why it's done. For convenience in this workshop, um, we're going to use the term scientists as shorthand to refer to specifically the subset of all scientists who are involved in scientific research that requires the care and use of animals and want to communicate effectively about it. And that's including all of the people who provide support to that research. So taking care of the animals, overseeing it and so on. Now, there are a number of topics that often elicit concerns and for which effective communication is needed. This includes topics like why are research studies de designed the way they are? What are the characteristics of animal models that make them especially valuable? What non-animal models are available and how do they compare with animal models? How meaningful are animal models for understanding human biology? What are the ethics of working with animals and of not working with animals? So this workshop will touch on some of these but the focus of the workshop is on the how-to, how to communicate effectively about what you want to communicate. It's not necessarily, the, the focus of the workshop is not necessarily about what you communicate about these topics. We are aware that a lot of work has been done on broader topics that are highly relevant. How to communicate effectively in general, how to communicate effectively about science, how to communicate, how to communicate effectively in a polarized society. We're not going to try to address those or even summarize all that in this workshop, but we hope to add a small piece to that conversation by focusing on the aspects that are specifically important to communicating effectively about research that involves animals. When you apply what you learn, what we hope you will learn in this workshop to communicating with any particular individual or group of individuals, we expect that you will have to do so within the context of those more general principles about effective communication. Um, and we also expect that you will have to customize it for the specifics of your situation, which include things about the nature of the research you're communicating about, the species of animals involved, and the perspectives of the people you will be communicating with. Now, why is it important for scientists to communicate effectively with the general public about research with animals? 
many scientists want to communicate with the general public about their research, but they're concerned about being misunderstood if we don't do it effectively. So that's why it's important to, to have a workshop on communicating effectively. It's also important to communicate at all because for people to make informed decisions about whether to support research with animals, it's crucial for them to have access to accurate information in context that addresses their individual concerns and reflects understanding of their individual values. So what makes communication effectively? Generally, the more it becomes a true two-way dialogue, the more effective it's likely to be. This requires that both parties then listen actively to understand and engage in the dialogue to be understood. That both parties expect to learn from the communication and to refine their own understanding in response to what they learn. That both parties have mutual respect for each other and that both parties recognize that complete agreement is not necessarily the goal. The planning committee recognized that the individuals involved in these communications bring a spectrum of diverse perspectives to the conversations. Just within the planning community itself, we had a huge array of different perspectives, different, different perspectives based on ethnicity, faith traditions, age, family background. You know, how many generations have you been in years? Has your family been in the United States? Education and expertise personal relationships with animals, all of those things. And we expect that the array of perspectives among you, the attendees, is probably even bigger. So although it's, it's crucial in any individual conversation to take into account each individual's personal perspectives, it's beyond the scope of this workshop to address all of those. So we acknowledge the differences, but the focus here will be on the perspectives that are shared. Um, the members of the workshop planning committee, and we presume most of you participating in the workshop, share a common interest in improving how effectively scientists communicate with the general public. We identified some stakeholder groups with whom scientists would like to communicate more effectively and whose shared perspectives are important for scientists to understand. So we chose to focus on communication with three of the groups each with a different set of shared concerns and priorities about animals in research. Private in individuals who are not scientists involved in research with animals, those who are um, regarded by private individuals as reliable sources of information, so that includes journalists, veterinarians, community leaders. And then the third group is those in leadership positions in the institutions where scientists work. Um, this would include not only the, the um, official leaders of the institutions, but also the communication specialists who implement the communication interests of the institution. So you can see from the bios of the planning committee members and the presenters something of our individual perspectives. So now we'd like to um, get a feel for the perspectives of the people participating in this workshop. And we're gonna ask a few polling questions. Each question will appear on your screen with a number of response options. Please click on as many of the options as you think apply to you and then click submit. We will not be collecting any information about who chose what and you are free to not answer if you don't want to. Um, we recognize that there may be more than one person attending under a single registration. And if that's the case, you can combine the answers in your group, um, however it seems appropriate to you. This is just to get a rough idea of where we're all coming from. So if you could um, post the first polling question, please. So the quite first question is, what do you consider to be your major role or roles related to this workshop? That includes scientists conducting biomedical laboratory research with animals, scientists conducting wildlife research, scientists conducting research for agricultural purposes, journalists, um, leaders of institutions where research is done with animals, research animal care specialists, veterinary specialists, um, and other, there might be other ones that are not listed. So just click however many apply. We'll give you a minute or so to do that.
Okay. So Okay, looks like it's slowing down. So let's go ahead and close the poll and take a look. Right, so we have a, a pretty good uh, mix here. Um, fair number of scientists, um, mostly connecting biomedical research, but some conducting other kinds of, of research involving animals. A few journalists, um, some leadership, some people who were involved in supporting the research, and then a fairly large number of other. So that's interesting, um, but it's good. It shows us the, the um, spectrum that we're, talk we're working with today. Okay. Um, now, if you could put up the next polling question, please. All right, now. Whatever your roles happen to be, um, with whom have you ever tried to talk about research with animals? Um, so have you tried to talk with members of the general public? And this would be specifically members of the general public who are not involved in research with animals. Have you tried to talk with members of the press? Have you tried to talk with institutional leaders or community leaders or a government official? So please click any or all that you have um, tried to talk with, successfully or not. Okay, let's go ahead and close that. And so this is um, perhaps reflecting the fact that you have tried um, and are interested in doing it. 97% have tried to talk with someone in the general public. And then um, a fair number have tried to speak with each of these other groups. So that's, that's very encouraging. Um, and then if you could post the third question, please. And this, is, this has to do with how successfully you feel that the talk went. So with whom have you talked, or not successfully, but that you've done it enough, um, with whom have you talked about research with animals often enough for it to feel familiar? Um, and this would be members of the general public, if you just done it once, standing in an airplane, airport um, security line, or have you done it a lot? Members of the press, institutional leaders, community leaders, and government officials. Just click as many as you think apply to you. And we'll take a look at where we are. Okay, Let's, we'll close that and show you the results. Um, so again, so 97% of the people who responded have tried to talk with members of the general public and 82% have tried often enough for it to feel familiar. So that's very good. Um, and we have a fair number of people who are comfortable um, or familiar, I shouldn't say comfortable, but familiar with talking with the press, with institutional leaders. Quite a few have tried to have, have gotten familiar with talking with institutional leaders, with community leaders and government officials. So thank you very much. Um, I, we appreciate your um, choosing to participate in this workshop and we hope you will find it interesting and useful and that you may gain some new understanding of how to communicate effectively with the general public. Now I'm gonna turn this over to our vice chair, Margaret Landy, who will say a few words. 
Hi, everyone. I just have a few words before we start because we're all anxious to kick this off. So this is a very unique design to a workshop. And the planning committee has worked very hard and we're very optimistic that it's going to work. We expect maybe a few technical difficulties because we've made it sort of a state of the art for us type of uh, workshop, but it is unique. And I do wanna mention the fact that while there's a number of topics, they're not in order of priority, they all work together. So just because one's first or one second, don't think of that as a priority listing. And again, as Alice already did in Nia, I wanna thank um, Alice, extraordinary uh, as the chair and all the members of the panels and the committee have been um, really working considering big holidays come up in a very few short days for, for many of us. So with that, I'm going to be introducing very quickly because you have their bios, I understand in your, in your packages. So I won't read what you already have, but we're gonna have Joe Newsom and Sally Thompson Irritani talk about the survey results. Sounds very bland, but this survey uh, through the round table is what sort of kicked, kicked all of this off. So Sally and Joe. Thank you, Dr. Landy. Uh, I'm gonna be brief here, but I was asked to give a little background on why we did a survey. And I think uh, what happened is the membership of the uh, round table on science and welfare and animal research uh, in mid-2022, uh, um, post-COVID, uh, was concerned that misinformation uh, for uh, science when animal research is warranted was also a, a, a problem that we could address. And uh, our survey of members said this was a top priority. And luckily, we were working with uh, Nia Johnson and Kavita Berger and the rest of the NASM team. And they worked with the academies to establish a workshop to discuss and share tools and approaches to improve our communication about scientific research related to working with animals. What happened is we decided that it would help us frame this workshop by providing some background on where is the state of the art of understanding on certain topics as it relates to animal use in wildlife and animal use in conservation, animal use in laboratory research, uh, even in zoos. So anywhere that uh, animal research is appropriately warranted. So um, we were lucky enough to uh, have the Academy set up a contract with Echelon Insights. Uh, and I don't know if that's the next slide, Sally, please. So Echelon Insights is a uh, nationally known uh, survey team, and basically they ran for a, uh, uh, a one-week uh, period a survey uh, that uh, matches the general uh, U.S. population uh, survey uh, metrics, and uh, 2,028 adults completed uh, the survey. And um, there was a very little sampling error uh, on, on this. And what we did is ask and broke down the survey questions um, that were reviewed by the membership of the roundtable uh, to help set the survey uh, on what we wanted to ask uh, in light of uh, us being a part of Basker uh, going forward. So um, I'll do the next slide there, Sally. So one of the big things was what demographic questions you ask in a survey. And um, this, these two slides show that we asked things about education. Uh, we asked things about age. We asked things about animal ownership, uh, experience or friends, uh, uh, health uh, or use of medications. Um, uh, all, uh, it's a very large survey. And, you know, Sally is going to, I'm going to hand it over to her and she's going to give a very, but I should say a very 30,000 foot overview of some of the surveys, but uh, we have a very strong working group that is working on a white paper to summarize uh, this. And we will include that in the workshop proceedings uh, when it gets published after this workshop. So that's our goal. And at this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sally thompson Tani. Sally, take it from here.
Thank you. I'm a little bit of a pacer, so I'm going to have this on. Is it working? Yay. Okay. So um, thank you all for being here today. As Joe mentioned, we're going to do a, a high-level overview of the survey results from this survey that was done by Echelon Insights. So um, as I present this data, there's a lot of graphs and a lot of information, and you're not expected to get all the detail from looking at these slides. They're going to be available. There's going to be an amazing workshop report that's going to go into more detail. What I'm going to try to do is we try to bring out the highlights. And these highlights are important information as we go forward for the next two days in getting this information and thinking about what do we do with this information. And that's all we're doing is providing the results we're not trying to interpret anything in this initial presentation. If as the days go on, you guys decide that you want to think about how we might be applying some of these results and thinking about them, how they might impact how we communicate with different groups. So that's the information we're trying to get from the survey. How does it influence how we communicate? And how should we be communicating with different individuals? Because we all take in information differently. So it's really important to think about that. So this slide just shows what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the numbers just so which slide we're starting on to talk about the different topics. So this is really just a content slide. One thing I do want to mention, we did ask some additional questions about wildlife that we're not going to go be able to go into detail on this morning. So there is some additional data. We'll definitely come out in the workshop report, but it's not in detail. There's, we're just touching on it here. A lot of what we're talking about today is research conducted in a laboratory setting. The next, this, I don't know, okay, the next slide. So this is the one slide I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on because I wanna just set up the stage for what the information is that you're looking at here. So this is a question that was asked. Please indicate to what extent you personally believe it is acceptable or unacceptable for humans to use animals in the following ways. And these are the questions that we asked. Raise livestock for meat to eat, hunt animals for meat to eat, have animals in zoos, conduct scientific research on wild animals in their natural habitats, use animals in scientific research conducted in laboratories, use animals for fur or skin to make clothing, use animals to test the safety of cosmetic, cosmetic products for humans, or hunt animals for trophy or sport. So those are the questions that are asked. The categories were acceptable in most cases, acceptable in all cases. And we kind of lump those together in a lot of our output that we're presenting today. There's also the category of unacceptable in most cases and unacceptable in all cases. And then there's also this middle, not sure. So what I'm gonna focus on, again, as I mentioned, is this use animals in scientific research conducted in laboratories. And what do our results show here? And as you can see along the right here, I kind of divided this out. Our results show that when we interviewed, when these participants took this survey, what they found was that there was 44% of the participants found that it was acceptable in all or most cases for scientific research conducted in laboratories to use animals. Okay, that was the result. 48% felt that it was unacceptable in all or most cases. And there was 7% that were unsure. Now, one thing I do wanna point out, if you look at conducting research on wild animals in their natural habitats, this actually where it was 67% felt that it was acceptable in all or most cases. Again, I'm not gonna go as much into those details. We're gonna talk more about this area of using animals in scientific research conducted in laboratories. So um, that, like I say, went into a little more detail on that because you'll see some similar things as we go through. We'll talk about how these, um, how these results were influenced by different parameters when we looked when we broke it out. So what, what did we look at when we looked at these participants who chose the different things of the acceptable or unacceptable? So one of the things that we tried to distinguish here was based on ideological differences. If the participants self-identified as conservative or liberal, did it influence how they felt about scientific research conducted in laboratories? And actually, this is one thing that it didn't seem to matter. There was around 48, 49%, whether they were liberal or conservative, had specified that research um, with animals was acceptable in all or most cases. You can see that the other uses that we talked about, there actually was much more of a split, um, except for again in the wildlife, there was more uh, put acceptable in all or most cases, but it was a higher percentage. This graph on the bottom actually shows it's out, broken out by gender. And this is just gender men, if they identified the participants 
participants identified as male or female, and then how they felt about these um, research uses. And what you can see here is again, a very big split. Men, 53%, felt that the research conducted in laboratories was acceptable in all or most cases. Women were at 34% acceptable in all or most cases. This was the, one of the biggest divides, except for the use of animals for fur or skins to make clothing. In general, men were more accepting of the use of animals across all of the categories, but there was one of the biggest differences in this one of use of animals in scientific research conducted in laboratories. So really want to distinguish that there was a 19 point difference on that parameter. When we broke this out by educational attainment, this was just looking at how the participants identified their own, their own educational level. So when we looked at this, as we mentioned, we did the gender and then college versus non-college. I do want to mention college versus non-college was divided into whether people had a high school or less or whether they had any college, any college level of attainment. And there's some interesting data here. College participants, you can see here, were at 60% felt that research conducted in laboratory with animals was acceptable in all or most cases. Um, people that identified as non-college, it was at 36%. So there's a very big difference here. Another big difference that was found, if we look down here at this table, is that if the high school or less or people that had self-identified as having a, an associate's degree were around the same, and anybody with a bachelor's degree or higher actually showed a higher level of feeling that it was acceptable to use animals in research. Also, interest people who identified that they were very interested in science in general across all of the categories had a higher level of, of um, identifying that it was acceptable in all or most cases to conduct research in, in, in laboratory animals. So when we just asked then, okay, so what is your background knowledge? How much do you actually feel like you know about animals in these different environments? The questions were, how much do you know about the use of animals in scientific research conducted in laboratories? And how much do you know about scientific re research conducted in animals in their natural habitat? Again, this kind of touches on the wildlife question. Um, and people felt in general that they knew just a lot or some about research in both of these environments. They did not feel that they, you know, it was 14% had a lot and 39%. It was very similar in both the laboratory environment and in the wildlife setting or the natural habitats. Um, and then there, there again, this difference between college and non-college, people who identified as having college level of educational attainment felt like they had more knowledge about what these natural settings looked like for both the laboratory and the natural setting. This is a really busy slide. So I'm just going to overview it. You're not, again, this is one you're not expected to get all this information because there is so much to it. And as we've been looking through this data and looking at where do people get their information? So those people who said they know a lot about what this looks like and a lot about what these different environments look like, where did they attain the information from? And there are so many sources of information. You can see all of these. There's over a dozen sources that were listed here. Where do you get your information from? And we then divided this out, as you can imagine, as we're looking at all this data. It's so interesting and so fascinating. So it started producing graph after graph after graph because there's so much here to look at. As you can see, these really colorful, beautiful graphs, and we can, we're not going to delve into them here, but we did then break these out by gender, age, race, education, interest in science, ideology, geography, whether they own animals, and their experience with an illness with someone close to them. When we look at all these things broken out, there are definitely some differences here that we need to tease out in where these different different people get their information, and what are our effective communication with these different sources. So we're going to talk a little bit about how this can tie in some, with some other things further on. Again, not going into detail, but just saying that there are so many information sources, and depending on many factors determines what information sources you might be relying on. This is a really interesting slide. Who do you trust? Who do you trust to give you the best information? This was how much do you trust each of the following to provide accurate information about the use of animals in scientific research conducted in laboratories? So if you ask all these participants who they trust, veterinarian scientists and medical doctors were at the top. 
this is a big responsibility, right? They trust you to give them really accurate information about this. So what are we doing to make sure that these people who are trusted actually have good, accurate information to share? And not trusted government officials, social media accounts, and elected officials were chosen as not trusted. Now, where does this put us? Actually, this has some really interesting information about this because one of the things that we have to think about is when we look at where we get our information versus who do we trust, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this slide because there's a lot, even though they're simple graphs, there's a lot of information here because we, source of information, you go to documentaries, podcasts, science-focused social media, these are the most relied upon, these participants chose these as the most relied upon sources of information. They rarely ask veterinarians, religious leaders, or publications, or advocacy organizations. They don't use those sources of information anymore, despite the fact that's who they trust. So they trust veterinarian scientists and medical doctors, but they're not relying on them very much. And the people that they don't trust, government, social media, and elected officials, social media is one of the top things that people are actually using as information source, despite the fact that we don't trust it. So again, that doesn't surprise any of us because it's so accessible, right? This is really easily accessible information and that's where we get our information. So I think these are really important points for us all to think about as we go through talking up to the next two days. This is um, something that, that will come up a few times. The other thing was, how do they feel about humane treatment of the animals? When we asked, different people have different ideas of what humane treatment of animals and scientific research conducted in laboratories should involve. So what would you say is absolutely necessary for the treatment of animals to be humane? Because I will tell you, if you look, and we even looked up a couple of different sources, how do you define humane treatment? It's very different depending on who's filling this out, right? So what we found, the participants in this survey, they defined humane treatment. The top thing was enough nutritious food and clean uh, water, clean living conditions, appropriate veterinary care, living spaces with room to move around naturally, medication to alleviate or minimize potential pain, environmental enrichment, opportunities to socially interact with other animals, and opportunities to spend time outdoors. These were all over 50% of what people would consider part of humane treatment. These are all things that we need to be communicating about. How are they incorporated? Are they incorporated and what do they look like? So then we looked at qualifiers. When animals are treated humanely, does it change what people mark on that acceptable in all or most cases? So um, to what extent do you personally believe it is acceptable? As we saw at the beginning of the survey, it was 44% acceptable in all or most cases overall. When we said, when the animals are treated humanely, is it acceptable? When we use that qualifier to develop medication or treatment for animals, 79% of the participants said it was acceptable in all or most cases. When we use this qualifier to develop medications or treatments for humans, 71% felt like it was acceptable in all the most cases. And when we said to conduct scientific research in general, which means just your foundational research, 66% said that it was acceptable in all the most cases. So what we found here is this really important qualifier about what does humane treatment look like and are we doing a good job of communicating about what that looks like. Um, then we said, okay, so we believe that humane treatment is incredibly important. What do we actually, what do the participants in this survey think is actually happening? So if you think each of the following usually happens or does not usually happen when animals are used in scientific research and conducted laboratory, in, in labor, when scientific research is conducted in laboratories, what do you believe is actually happening? And we found that over 50% said that animals are housed in cramped cages without enough space and animals are subjected to unnecessary pain, which they consider negatives. But that's the message that they're hearing and that is what's being communicated. Uh, they believe that animals um, believe, receive adequate food, water and veterinary care, which they consider we consider positive in terms of humane care. But again, more than half believe that there's cramped conditions and animals are subjected to unnecessary pain. 
So, and then this, when we looked at participants who had marked on the initial survey that it was acceptable in all or most cases to use animals in research, um, they were more likely to believe the positive statements with a very big point spread there of, of how the care of animals goes, how, what the care of animals looks like in these environments, um, and, and less likely to believe the negative statements about cramped conditions and unnecessary pain. So. Okay, um, again, breaking this out by gender. While men remain more likely to accept animal research, majority of women also say it is more acceptable when the animals are treated humanely. So this shows that um, just the men versus women, not the big 19 point spread that we saw in that initial um, survey result. They're very close now, closely aligned. Women are more accepting again when the treatment is humane and men and women are more accepting when the research is used to develop treatment for animals. And we've seen this communication over and over. There's a much better understanding and appreciation when the treatments are used to develop, when it's used to develop treatments for animals. And among those who initially felt that research was unacceptable, it actually did influence their opinion if they felt that the animals were treated humanely. So 73% again said it was okay to develop treatment for animals, 58% if, treat, if treatment for humans and 51% for science in general. And again, this is broken out by the ones who initially said it was unacceptable in all or most cases. I know I'm throwing a lot of data at you. <laughs> Everyone need a break? <laughs> so regarding regulations, how do people feel about the current regulations that are underway to, to regulate the use of animals in research? Um, so the questions were based on what you know about government regulation of use of animals and scientific research conducted in laboratories. Do you think there is? and then it was not enough about the right amount or too much regulation or unsure. And then we also asked the same question about research in animals in their natural habitats. So regarding the regulations, actually it was fairly similar, whether in the laboratory or in their natural habitats, um, about a third actually felt like there was not enough regulation. And about a third think it's just right and then it was kind of split. Not many thinking there was too much regulation, even though I know there's different philosophies about that. And a lot were just not sure because maybe they don't really know what those regulations look like. Um, and again, we, this was fairly standard across ideolo ideologies, people feeling about the regulations, about a third feeling like there actually is not enough regulation. Regarding species acceptability. Are there certain species that people were more or less comfortable using in animal research? And this question was to develop medications or treatments specifically for humans. So looking at that and asking, is it acceptable to, develop, to use these animals to develop treatments specifically for humans? The most accepted was use of rodents, actually mice and rats at 25%. All, in all cases and 43% in most cases. So a very high percentage, 67% in all in most cases. Next was fish actually was lower than um, rodents at uh, 60%, reptiles and amphibians, rabbits, cows and pigs at 56%, cephalopods, we all know there's a lot of discussion about cephalopods right now at 55%. Sheep and goats going down to um, monkeys and other non-human primates was 55%. And it goes all the way down to cats and dogs, which are actually below 50% at 47% each. So I think, again, showing this degree is really important, again, for our communications about which animals are used and how they're used. What about, the, we're gonna talk some about NAMS a little bit later because this acronym is quite the acronym and it has so many different ways, but NAMS, you can say novel alternative methods, you can say non-animal models. And I think you'll hear tomorrow, there's somebody did a little metric on how many different ways this acronym is used, but just letting you all know that these are, are um, models that do not use animals. We're gonna put it at that. Um, but so they're based on what you know about current scientific research methods. Do you think the use of animals in scientific research conducted in laboratories can now be replaced in all cases? Can now be replaced in most cases? Unsure, is still necessary in most or is still necessary in all cases? So when we ask that question, 47% felt like it could be replaced in all or most cases. Again, um, and then 
those, when we broke that out by what they put on the first initial survey, did they feel that animal research was acceptable? There was a much lower percentage, 34% felt like it could be replaced. And when we broke it out by those that found it was unacceptable in all the most cases on the initial survey, 62% felt that it could be replaced. So again, really important information when, where, and how we can replace the use of animals and utilize the NAMS. I'm just saying NAMS because there's so many different definitions out there for that nice acronym. This again, I know you can't read all of these, but I am gonna summarize them for you and they were gonna make them available. What we wanna get across here is that the messaging is so important and that's part of what we're gonna be talking about for the next two days. When we message things, it changes people's attitudes. Um, when there were pro-animal research messages shown to the respondents, and these included things like the joint benefit of insulin for both humans and animals. Insulin is an amazing story. It has shown that it can be used and it's effective and helps treat both humans and animals. You get the most, ben you, you, this is a very convincing argument for those uh, that were found that the research was acceptable in animals. Um, talking about, again, the animal benefit that there actually was no alternative. Interestingly, the COVID-19 argument was not as persuasive as some of the other arguments, the development of the COVID-19 vaccine, which I think with all the controversy around vaccine, maybe there, that, that would contribute some to, to how this would be interpreted. But positive messaging definitely was looked at as convincing and influential. Negative messaging. Negative messaging, we, these were um, the information taken for this, these quotes and these messagings were actually taken from different sites um, that they gathered. And, and so the treatment of sentient creatures. So again, this talks about humane treatment. If the animals are not treated humanely, this is obviously something that's very convincing against the use of animals in research. Unnecessary, that they can be replaced. Um, somewhat convincing and pointless was not quite as convincing, but there still was some convincing of, of the not using animals in research for that. So this goes now, when, what we did then is after participants took this whole survey and then we asked them the same question and to see if they changed their mind. So at the end of the survey, did they feel differently than at the beginning of the survey? And they did. What we got was at the beginning of the survey, we saw that 44% said that it was acceptable in all and most cases. At the end of the survey, 55% said that it was acceptable in all and most cases. And attitudes, 10% uh, more people found the use of animals in scientific research conducted in laboratories acceptable in most cases. This was the biggest shift from 31 up to 43%. And um, the, the, the biggest decrease was actually unacceptable in all cases. So this seemed to be shifting. We don't know where the, you know, we can look at where the actual participants shifted from. So many things to follow up on. Why did they change their mind? When we look to see why did participants change their mind? Because they felt the benefit for humans was important. They, it actually, the survey caused them to think more deeply about the use of animals in research. They realized that it actually is the best option, that maybe there aren't alternatives available. Um, they also, the benefit for animals had a big impact on their, on their opinions. Humane treatment and species dependent, realizing the, uh, the um, different species that were used to develop these treatments. Lots of data, lots to, lots to tease through. Um, we're not going to tease through all of it in the next two days, um, but I think that hopefully you have an overview of some of the things that we saw and maybe will lead to more discussion. Um, there's so much to do. We're hoping over the next year even to delve in more deeply to a lot of the topics that came out of this survey because it does just make us think more about what this can look like. I want to give a shout out again to Echelon Insights who did this survey. They did an amazing job. I also just want to give a shout out to the whole round table and particularly our Wednesday morning morning crew um, with Nia and Mariah and Pat and Brianna and Nira, Joe and I uh, on the Wednesday morning crew. We get together Wednesday mornings and go over the survey trying to get this white paper. We thought it was going to be in August. That didn't happen. Kind of got delayed a little bit, but we're hoping uh, with this uh, amazing workshop, really sending this off that we're going to be moving that forward as quickly as possible. So I think now we have some time for questions. Great. Sure. Thank you. 
Okay, if can you, you do put, the Q&A? Yeah. If you could put your questions in the Q&A. You go over there, Joe, so we don't, okay. <laughs> so we don't get feedback. Well, the, the first question is, uh, will the slides uh, um, be available uh, from your presentation today? And yes, they will. Um, uh, most of this is recorded and will be shared uh, with the participants uh, and the public uh, in the future. Yeah, the slides will be available. And as we said, there will be an in-depth you know, write-up of all the information included in the workshop report. So. All right, Sally, I'm going to give this one to you. How do you explain the gender differences? I know we said we weren't going to do interpretations <laughs> here, uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting question I know we've been bantering about a little bit. Yeah, we have been really thinking a lot about how do you explain the gender, and I think that's something we actually should talk about over the next two days, and how do people take in information, how do we process it, and what do we do with the information, and I, I don't feel like I personally can explain the gender differences, except that they're there. We're just presenting the data, as we said, and I think that really understanding why people actually feel so differently about this is something that we need to spend a little bit more time talking about. Um, I you know, obviously it's, you know, uh, demographically there's so many challenges. And, and so I think that thinking about what those could look like, is there something, oh, you got getting up. Okay. Sorry. Um, did you have any more you wanted to add to that? We have been talking a lot about it. We, you know, there's, there's a lot of stereotypes of male versus female. So I think that we don't know how much of that we should like rely on Our you know, people saying females might be more nurturing and this is having a bigger influence on them if they're worried about unnecessary pain or what things can look like. Um, we can talk about that. We can think about that, but there may be a lot of other factors that, that are playing into this. And I want to be sure we think more broadly. Thanks, Sally. Uh, so one of the questions here is probably one I can handle very quick. Was there evaluation of members of the public view, trust, scientists, MDs, and veterinarians when they actually dual share as elected officials? And no, we did not get into that granularity in the survey. Um, so that was something that we didn't do. Um, one of these questions is something that we talk about that we should do, and that's part of our white paper about what we might do in the future for future surveys, is did you ask at all about transparency? In other words, did you get feedback about whether people in the survey would like to know more about what goes on in labs? We did not ask that question specifically, um, but we have so many, like one of the things we found is that there's always things that we wish we would have asked, that we wish we would have thought about in going forward in future surveys. As we all know, we also need to be very consistent between surveys as we, you know, you'd want a survey to be very replicable. So we, are, we can think about how we might want to add more questions, but we don't want to change questions if we want to compare longitudinally. Uh, this next question uh, is, do you have any data on food animal use and research? Uh, so the survey did add questions both for food and fiber uh, uh, based research. And also there's some uh, data in there about conservation um, and, and zoo uh, research that's required. So uh, uh, those details uh, will come out forth forthcoming with the white paper. So uh, question for you, Sally, uh, do you think the ICOC specialists are missing category that the public needs to hear from? So the people that oversee the, the management and use of these animals in research, um, you know, do they need to be a voice uh, and explain to those uh, what are the best practices and how they're reviewed? I would definitely say yes, particularly when you see that a third of the participants in the survey said there were not enough regulations. I think there's a misunderstanding about how, what those regulations are and how they're implemented and what that oversight looks like. So I think the more that the um, ICOC and oversight people at different organizations can speak out to that, I think it would be very helpful. So yes, I think that's a, a population that, that should be working. And hopefully it, it looked like a lot of them were attending. I saw a question when we were doing the polls the beginning that, that maybe that was one of the things that people felt like we missed is, is that population. So really making sure that, that we recognize how important that role is. So this one's a very interesting. Um, how would you consider that you can communicate with kids and teenagers? They are the ones often that are bringing messages home and influence adult parents' perceptions on this subject. 
Um, so I don't know if our survey delved into this, but do you have any thoughts you want to share with everybody about uh, getting the message out to the younger generation? Our survey did not ask that specifically, and I'm hoping that we get some more ideas over the next two days about how to properly bridge that, because I can tell you for myself, I, when my, my kids hold me accountable for something, that is one of the biggest influencers for me, is, and when the next generation is holding me accountable. So I think that's something we have to really think about. We have to think about that messaging. We have to think about what we're doing that's accurate, that's really portraying how we're caring for these animals and how important the science is. So yeah, I think that there is an opportunity and I think we're going to hear more about that over the next two days. So looking forward to that. <laughs> um, this questionnaire was uh, interested in the gender gap uh, and was wondering if uh, that review of the survey questions at the end, uh, uh, could that be parsed out a little bit about uh, pre and post survey opinions? That is fantastic. Yes, I'm sure that we have it parsed out in a graph. We have 100 pages of graphs, quite honestly, I think. And so, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I, one of the things I think that we're going to be looking at after this workshop is how do we carry this forward and even get more information from these survey results and some of the other things, and what does that look like? Um, and so we have some, we're currently kind of talking about some plans for how we can move that forward. Well, this question is somebody that actually delved into the survey that was uh, published. Uh, they want to know if we drop the Southern contingency out of this survey, do any of the numbers change significantly? Uh, we did not do that analysis because we did, as you know, presented at the beginning, there was a larger Southern contingency. It was 40% versus some of the other areas. So we, I don't think that we, we do have graphs that have the different geographical regions. So we certainly could look at that and see how that influences things. But I don't remember that data off the top of my head. I don't know if you do, Joe. No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, this question is, how knowledgeable do we actually believe the public is about regulations involved with animal research? Can they even name the regulatory agencies involved? Uh, I'll take this one, Sally. Uh, you know, I think uh, we saw that there was a gap in there, a knowledge and understanding about regulation. And maybe that what we'll get out of this workshop is that maybe one of our focal points uh, going forward uh, when we try to communicate about this, uh, this topic. So that's my two cents on that one. Um, on the role of teens, would the committee be willing, planning to make the survey more targeted to teens in the future and, and get their, uh, their opinions about this? That is a great idea that we can definitely take back to the, we can take that back to the round table. Well, I know there's a challenge to doing uh, surveys of underage individuals, and this was all done uh, following uh, uh, normal human subject survey uh, approvals. Um, so if you're doing it for adolescents, uh, there are additional regulations and sign off by parents and stuff uh, to participate, uh, but it could be something we consider. And I have one last one. Uh, I think we already answered that one. So, um, oh, wait a minute. Here we go. I knew it was coming in. <laughs> Given the dramatic differences in support of animal research between those with at least a bachelor's degree and those without, is that indicative that the public's documented overall lack of scientific literacy is a concern with communicating when there's a need to use animals in research? So science literacy being a problem to get this message across. That's why we have this workshop. That's <laughs> my best answer for that one. This is why we need to be talking and figuring out what does effective communication look like for all backgrounds, right? And um, this is something that we really need to figure out how we can communicate effectively across all of these different areas. And I know both Sally and I are very excited about what's going to come out of this workshop, as well as the rest of the roundtable members. And we'd like to stop our session right now, and we'd like to hand it back over to our chair, Dr. Alice Wong. Go ahead. <laughs> Does the next speaker have slides? Thank you so much, Joe and Sally. There's obviously a lot of information to look at there for the attendees. Um, the slides um, and well, the report about the survey will be provided with the um, the, the proceedings of the of this workshop. So you'll get to 
dig into it more um, to your heart's content. So now we're going to move on to the first of four sessions that, that are planned in this workshop to address specifically what <clears throat> scientists can do better on with regard to communicating effectively with different stakeholders. So each one of these sessions involves first um, a presenter who, or a presentation about concerns that are common to one of the groups of stakeholders. So the, the survey showed, showed some of the concerns that people have, um, focused a lot on the opinions that people already have. And so now we wanna dig into a little bit, what concerns do they have that scientists might be able to address better? Um, after the present or mixed in with the presentation, um, we'll have an illustrative role-playing conversation between the presenter and a scientist. And they were given the following instructions. Both parties are supposed to be willing to engage, perhaps grudgingly or impatiently or skeptically, but without animosity. And to focus on the information that's being communicated and not on the character, the background, the experience, et cetera, of the other person. The presenter was asked to be difficult and challenge the scientist, but not to the point of shutting the conversation down because we wanted to have something to look at. Um, and then the scientist was asked to try to address the concerns that were mentioned by the presenter in the presentation. After that, um, we would have an analysis of that role-playing conversation um, to talk about what went right, what went wrong, what was useful, what did they, what were they thinking when they said one thing or another? What did they wish they had said? All of that kind of thing. And then we'll have another Q&A session um, where the attendees will be welcome to submit questions using the Q&A button. Um, and we'll try to get to as many of the questions that are related to the topic of the session as we can. So for our first one of these kinds of sessions, our presenter is Mr. Paul McKellips. We asked Paul to participate in this workshop because of his training and many years of experience with communications in the motion picture industry and as a national TV correspondent and media and public affairs trainer focused on international diplomatic and military matters. In addition to that, he's also familiar with the issues related to scientific research with animals because of his experience working with the Federation for Biomedical Research. Dr. Matthew Rasset will play Rasset, sorry, will play the role of the scientist in the conversations for this session. Matt is a boarded laboratory animal veterinarian with over 15 years of experience in both academic and government settings. In this role, he has become familiar with both the perspectives of the research <laughs> investigators he works with and the need for effective communication with the general public about their work. He is currently a veterinary medical officer working with the Department of Veterans Affairs. So if we could um, show Paul next, um, we'll get started with this session. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Alice, for the hey, uh, introduction. Are we- You're muted. Okay, I'm muted. I'm unmuted on my side. Wait, we can't hear you. They're working on it. Let me know if we're there. We can hear you very loud okay. and clear. All right, good deal. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, before we play the first uh, video of the role play, I wanted to make just uh, three quick points. We're, we're really talking about effective communication with the media. Uh, which uh, is a sour point for just about everybody in uh, biomedical research, especially those who use animals in research. It's difficult. Uh, we know that the uh, media and the general public uh, can be, there can be some animosity, uh, some skepticism, and certainly lots of gotcha questions. But the first point that I want to make is about style. Oftentimes, uh, I would say of, of all the folks that are um, listening and watching today, you probably have advanced degrees up to 
uh, certainly masters, PhDs, MDs, uh, all those kinds of things. And we typically want to communicate from that position of scientific literacy, of that extended education. The first point that I want to make is that it's your personality that really drives your connection with the audience. It's not your education. Uh, people are not as excited about what degrees you have and what experience you have as much as they're interested in, can you connect with the audience? Can you connect with me? Keep in mind, there's 8 billion and one on this planet. I added you so that we could get to a full 8 billion. There are 325 million here in the United States alone. There are more messages going out per millisecond competing for 325 million ears, eyes, thoughts, emotions, hearts, and minds. There are 8 billion of us that are competing and sorting through that chaotic morass of information that's out there. So keep in mind that your style must be your personality not your level of expertise. The second thing I want you to understand is that at least in the realm of media, there is a preposition that begins, which is gotcha. Uh, I used to be a national TV correspondent covering the Pentagon, the State Department, uh, and uh, the Supreme Court. And it was amusing to me uh, that in the morning on the 4 a.m. call with the producer, I was told what the angle of my story was going to be. And so on one particular occasion, I was sent to the Pentagon with the explicit purpose of bashing the Bush administration for their policy on Liberia. Now, I didn't know what the policy on Liberia was. I didn't know what the Bush administration had done incorrectly, but that was my angle. And I pushed back on the producer and I said, well, how about if I get an interview with someone who thinks the policy is correct and someone who thinks the policy is incorrect and then let the viewer decide what their opinion might be? They said no. In fact, they didn't even want any interviews. They wanted me to stand up in the press room at the Pentagon and explain why the policy was incorrect in Liberia. So oftentimes when you get a reporter from the media that's coming to talk to you, their producer has already determined what the angle of the story is. So keep that in mind. The last thing that I want to point out is I've got, I've got a book here. It's on whiskey taste. It is a thick book. The temptation is to explain to an audience how whiskey is made and distilled, how there's so many different varieties, uh, there's so many ways that you should clean your palate before you taste uh, any whiskey. Really, the mission in a media interview is to give me a very small taste so then I can determine, hmm, would I want to look into that further? Uh, sometimes we try to explain the entire book Rather than just tempting somebody to read Tolstoy's War and Peace, we want to tell them the whole story, and it never resonates with the audience. Without further ado, before I go into the four techniques uh, for doing media interviews, let's play the first role play that Matt and I did. Uh, and I got to tell you, uh, for a cold role play interview of a reporter with a subject matter, Matt did an outstanding job. There wasn't much room for improvement. So if we can, let's cue up that video. Uh, hello, Dr. Rassett. It's a uh, glad you could join me today uh, just for a couple of quick questions. Uh, looking a little bit at your research, and I see that first responders, veterans, virtually any burn victim uh, caught in a fire uh, can experience traumatic burn injuries. What are some of the challenges physicians currently face uh, when doing skin grafts on burn patients? Thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Pablo. Um, one of the big challenges that they face is that uh, when you have a large skin defect, um, the skin sometimes doesn't close properly. 
Um, what m my team and I have done is we have uh, found a way to engineer uh, uh, the, the person's own cells to, to overcome some of these difficulties and heal faster and with less chance of infection. Um, interesting. So what's the breakthrough that your research team has seemingly uncovered? What's different? What's different is we're able to take cells from an individual, um, change the way that uh, that their those cells go about doing their day to day lives as cells, um, using a revolutionary new technology called CRISPR. Um, once we've made that change, we're able to put those cells and deploy them in the actual burn site or or the any defect site. It doesn't have to be a burn. Um, and we're able to find some some much more rapid healing and. Uh, it's really a revolutionary change that, that we're excited to be able to bring and use to help patients. So you mentioned that your research um, in your press release, it says you use pigs. Mm -hmm. How did you go about burning pigs to simulate conditions uh, that a human burn patient might be exposed to? It's an important question. Um, in fact, we did not burn any pigs. Um, as I mentioned, these skin defects are able uh, th that we're studying are able to be created simply by doing um, something called a punch biopsy. And it's a very small outpatient procedure that's normally performed in, in humans where um, the human doesn't feel anything. Uh, we did the exact same type of procedure in a, in a pig. Um, where we used a skin block to basically take out a portion of the skin um, so the animal didn't feel anything. We then basically later went back and created another se uh, set of those uh, skin defects and used these skin cells from these pigs uh, to test the concept that it would work. This is, of course, following on from years of research that we have done um, on benchtop and, and in in the lab. Um, I mean, obviously, human patients can describe their pain from burns or, or other maladies, uh, especially from skin grafting. How do pigs tell you uh, that your research hurts? How do they express to you pain? I mean, I, I understand you've done punch biopsies. But I would assume there has to be something else to test whether or not uh, a skin graft is actually going to work before you try it on a human. Sure. So there's two important parts to your question. The first is how do we uh, detect discomfort in, in the uh, laboratory animals, in the pig in this particular? Um, the, one of the ways that we do that is by looking at their faces. We can study um, what's called a facial grimace score um, and also... Mm -hmm we give a lot of care and, and time to these animals. We know them as individuals and we're able to tell, um, you know, in the same way that you'd be able to tell if your cat or your dog is off a little bit, they're, you know, they're not eating their feed, they're, they're not playing with their toys, they're not interacting us, with us in the same way. And, and then we're able to bring that to the attention of the veterinarians. In terms of the second part of your question, trying to uh, see how we translate that into human clinical trials. It's crucial that we start out um, in an animal model so that we're, before we move on to, to human clinical trials so that we can really find out, um, find out more information. The pig is a great model for this, uh, as it turns out. Hmm. Uh, I guess using any animal in painful research is controversial, especially there in Minnesota. How do you justify putting these animals through that pain? And once your pain research is concluded, are these pigs just sent back to a farm or, or do they live uh, forever in a cage in, in your laboratory or do you kill these pigs? Mm -hmm. So it's important to, to note, Paul, that, that, um, what we do with, with these animals is tended to help the humans on, on the other end of it, but it also will end up helping um, helping many uh, patients uh, that are treated by veterinarians. Um, and in terms of how we go about uh, 
you know, what happens to these animals at the end of the study. Um, one of the key ways that we will know whether or not this has been successful and whether or not it's been safe is by looking at all of the different parts of the animal. And unfortunately, to do that, we do have to humanely euthanize these animals. Um, well, thanks, Matt. I appreciate your time and uh, really appreciate you uh, talking to us about your research. Uh, so Matt did a phenomenal job with that. And uh, the next video that I'm going to show you here in just uh, several minutes will be after I give him the coaching that I'm going to give you right now. Uh, and actually, uh, he did a sensational job. There's four points uh, that I want you to keep in mind with media interviews and really just talking to the general public that maybe does not have uh, the scientific literacy that you do. The first one is attention span. Uh, keep in mind that research has determined that goldfish have an attention span of 9.25 seconds. Microsoft found that interesting, and over the last uh, 20 years, they've done research on the attention span of humans. And as of about eight years ago, the attention span of humans is eight seconds. Goldfish are going to pay more attention to your messaging than humans are. And if you Keep in mind that we speak at about 135 words per minute, and our attention span is eight seconds. You've got about 20 words to hook, capture, and hold someone's attention. <clears throat> and if you watch any kind of television news, uh, if we were to have put Matt's interview on television, we're looking for an eight second sound bite. That's the magic number because the attention span of the viewer, of anybody you're talking to, is about that eight seconds. Why can't we pay attention for longer than eight seconds? I'm going to tell you, it's real simple. This thing. Every time it buzzes, in fact, uh, for those of you that are watching in your offices or at home or wherever you are right now, you're multitasking. You're doing something else even as I'm talking. Your phone is chattering. It's vibrating. And you have a Pavlovian response that says, who is it? What is it? What do I need to do? We are like that. Now multiply that times 8 billion people around the world. And you can see why you can't be teaching the history of whiskey. You've got to give them just a taste. If you want to hold their attention, give them the taste for eight seconds. And then the eight, next eight seconds, you've got to re-win their attention. So our communication with the media, which is the public, has to be fast. It has to be short. It has to be insightful. And it has to hook them in to hold them for another second or two. So the first point, again, I want to make is attention span. The second thing is that you need to understand them before trying to be understood. The problem we often make in biomedical research is the same one we make in the military or in diplomacy or in any other organization where I've coached uh, with media training or platform uh, skills or just speaking to the public, public speaking. The problem that we do is we try to be understood before we understand our audience. If you want to understand the audience of biomedical research, of the military, of diplomacy, you need to understand that we all have shared experiences. This goes back to that style, that personality. You see, if you try to tell me about your biomedical research and what you're doing with uh, mice and, 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 and the different biomarkers and all this technical, scientific, literate uh, jargon, I'm not interested. It just doesn't appeal to me. It's not my thing. What I'm interested in is I, I've got a friend who has a glioblastoma and they're suffering and, and, and what's going on? 
that somebody who has heart stents, somebody who's got pacemakers, I don't understand that. Somebody with, uh, with different maladies and conditions, and it's the liver, it's the lungs, it's, it's all those kinds of things. I need to understand how your work impacts the people I love. We never start with trying to be understood. We start with trying to understand what is the human condition? What are the shared experiences? In the case of Matt's interview on skin grafts, the end is people who have suffered horrific burns and skin maladies. The first responders, the firefighters, the folks in combat, the ones that get caught in a house fire, the ones that fried a turkey at Thanksgiving and it didn't work well. We start by understanding the shared experiences. And that really is the third point. We always begin with the end. Did you get that? Begin with the end. Every time you're speaking in public or every time you're talking to the media, begin with the end. It's not where you are currently in the biomedical research process. It's where the human is in that condition. And not just humans, but animals, our pets, our livestock. What is the condition they're in in the end that requires us to do what you're doing in the beginning? We can talk about getting a drug to market. We can talk about the, the need for uh, using animals in research, but that's not what the people are interested in. The people are interested in is the ending situation that their loved ones, their friends, their colleagues are in. And when you can connect with that shared experience of beginning with the end and then walk that back to where you are, that's how we're starting to make the connection. But again, we have a limited attention span. If you start talking to me about basic biomedical research at the beginning of this process and then project it out to the end, you've already lost me. You've lost the audience. We have to start with the end and then bring it back. We want to keep in mind, number one, the attention span. Number two, we have to understand before trying to be understood. And number three, always begin with the end. And before I go to my last point, let's, re, let's redo the interview with Matt. If you'll cue up that video, let's go to that and see how he implemented some of the changes, some of the coaching that I'm talking about. Well, Matt, that was a, a fantastic role play. Uh, so let me give you a couple of techniques. The attention span of goldfish is 9.25 seconds. The attention span of humans is now 8 seconds. Uh, your first answer was 24 seconds. That's not bad. Uh, second answer was 36. And then they got progressively longer as the subject matter got more difficult. Because obviously you can see I was moving in on the inflammatory language with, with animals. Uh, so keep that in mind is that the eight second rule for, you know, obviously you're talking to a reporter, but it's the audience that you're going to be playing to, especially if it's a non-scientific, uh, if it's your local TV news, if it's some kind of other thing, if it's a local newspaper, these are typically not science writers. These are general interest. So keep your answers pithy. Uh, the second thing that I want to tell you is always start with the end. In this case, it's the translational research. Uh, it's the human condition uh, that uh, requires us to do the research to figure out if it translates to the human condition. So use examples to start with of uh, burn patients, first responders, firefighters, uh, veterans in combat, or anybody with some kind of a skin issue that is the start. Start there, paint that picture, and then your research becomes a lot more palatable to the viewer, to the reader. The third thing I want to tell you is, obviously, I used loaded inflammatory language. You 
did a terrific job of avoiding what I think is the uh, worst word in the history of animal research, and it's called use. It's that dirty three-letter word. If you substitute animal use with uh, senior citizen use or children use, it's just a, it's a horrible word. And of course, we have institutional uh, committees that have use in the middle of uh, their words with an I equivalent. Uh, so it's the one word that I uh, that I would suggest we try to avoid at all points. The last thing is you get to answer whatever question you want. So at the end, when I say, uh, I mean, do you kill these animals? How do you know they're having pain? Uh, you did this a couple of times. You say, hey, that's a great question. You go ahead and pivot to whatever you want to answer. When you get an inflammatory question, nod your head. Yeah, that's a good question. And then you can say, and the moon reflects a dimly white light. You know, to give you a metaphor, that you can say whatever you want to say. You are not obligated in any manner or fashion to answer that reporter's question. That is obviously a gotcha question. So without further ado, let me run through those questions again with some of those thoughts in mind. Uh, Dr. Rissa, uh, first responders, veterans, virtually anybody who has been a burn victim caught in a fire experiences traumatic burn injury. What are some of the challenges physicians are currently facing uh, when doing skin grafts with those kinds of patients? Well, thank you, Paul. The, those, the patients with those kinds of, uh, those kinds of conditions are, are really suffering uh, horribly, and it's important that we find ways to, to treat them. Um, we can remove that disfigurement and, and improve their lives considerably through this research. That's great. Um, what is the exact breakthrough that your research team has seemingly uncovered? We found a way to change skin cells so that they heal faster and better. Oh, that, <laughs> you just went outside the park with that answer. What a terrific research. Um, you mentioned in your press release that your research uses pigs. How do you burn pigs uh, to simulate the human condition that patients might expect? That's a great question. Um, it, it turns out that using pigs is, is a great way to simulate the, the human condition. And it's important to note that these animals are very well cared for and, um, and, and in fact, uh, you know, are loved by many of the people who are working with them. Um, they're, they're, but they do not have to be burned in order to answer this question. And so because of that, we, we don't do that. Um, it's enough for us to make a small skin defect in order to answer this question. And we don't want to do more than we have to. That's great. Uh, you did start off using the word you using, uh, so just be mindful of that. Obviously, human patients can describe their pain from burns and skin grafting. How do pigs tell you about their pain when, they're, when you're doing research? Another great question. Um, we we will basically um, take our knowledge of these animals and as individuals and find ways to to make sure that they're comfortable throughout this process. Uh, and then finally, using any animal in what I would consider painful research uh, is controversial, especially there in Minnesota. How do you justify putting these animals through that pain? And once your pain uh, painful research has concluded. Are, are these pigs sent back to farms? Pets? Uh, did they live forever in your laboratory in, in, in some kind of a cold cage? Uh, or do you kill them? It's a great question, Paul. Um, so we it's really crucial to, to the research, to helping these burn victims and these patients, um, that we know that the techniques that we're using are safe. And so it's important to, to take a look at the animal once the study is completed. And so as a result of that, we, we do humanely euthanize these animals. Great. Uh, before, you end this, before we end this recording, that's terrific. Um, as, you can, as you can tell, um, because of PETA and everything else, everybody's got some issues with regard to using animals. Uh, again, you don't even have to answer that inflammatory question. Uh, with even the humane euthanization at the end, uh, because you circled back 
and you talked about the human condition. And at that point, period, end of sentence, called it good. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate you uh, role playing with me. No worries. Thank you, Paul. Well, there's a um, there's a great example. Um, Matt, uh, terrific job. You know, one of the things that I, I want to reiterate is you don't have to answer the reporter's questions. You can pivot. Uh, we see that all the time uh, in a press conference in the White House where a question is answer, asked, uh, it's acknowledged, and then the talking point is reiterated with maybe a little of flavor towards that question. Uh, but make sure that when you go into any kind of media interview, you know specifically what your talking points are. Uh, assume uh, that there's going to be some gotcha questions and then pivot to the answer you want. One of the, one of the things that as a reporter, what I see Matt doing in that is when he says, hey, great question. That's really a verbal pause that he knows is not going to make the edit. And it gives him an extra click, an extra second to formulate how he's going to respond to a question. Uh, so, you know, understand that you can play uh, strategically against a reporter just as much as a reporter is playing strategically against you. The last point that I want to make, the first, let me just reiterate. The attention span, we got eight seconds. That's about 20 words. Uh, the second point, you want to understand before trying to be understood. The third point, begin with the end. Always go to the final condition, whether it's humans, pets, livestock, whatever it is, go to the end first, because that's how you're going to capture the attention. The last thing I... I, I want to convey to all of you, and I mean all of you, everybody needs an elevator pitch. Absolutely every one of you needs an elevator pitch. In Hollywood, uh, I started my career there, and that came from the notion that you might get on the elevator uh, in a entertainment uh, office complex. There might be the executive vice president of production, and you've got this great idea for a script, well, you've got one or two floors, about 30 seconds to make your pitch. And if you captured his or her attention, they might invite you in for another minute or two. And if not, they would turn around and bid you adieu. Every one of us has neighbors uh, on the block. Uh, every one of us has uh, friends and colleagues that are not in biomedical research, that are not uh, in animal research. Every one of us probably gets on an airplane and the person sitting next to us turns around and says, so what do you do for a living? That 30 second elevator pitch should be just rolling off the tip of your tongue. And let me tell you what the first word should never, ever, ever be. The first word of your elevator pitch should never be I. I work as a I am a. The last thing to connect with anybody else is the word I. The most powerful word, you. Let me give you an example. You realize that there's human suffering everywhere. You've had loved ones uh, who have suffered from cancers and cardiovascular issues, uh, diabetes, heart disease. Hey, all these different maladies. And we know at the end that none of us are getting out alive. We're all going to face death. We're all going to face that kind of suffering at the end. And that's why it's so incredibly important that we continue to advance our understanding of these conditions. And what I do is work in a laboratory to understand how can we minimize that suffering? How can we extend our lifespans? How can we help treat people that have these cancers and cardiovascular issues? That's what I do. If you can formulate that in your own words for 30 seconds, and remember that first eight seconds is gonna keep them listening for the next eight seconds, then you have found a bridge 
over that chasm between literary science and the general public that thinks, talks, and feels usually at an eighth grade level. When you see the evening news locally, it's targeted for eighth graders. When you see the national news on television, it's targeted for 11th graders. We are not targeting PhDs and those who have defended a thesis in their master's program. So with that, quick summary, it's the attention span. Understand before you try to be understood, begin with the end and always, always, always have an elevator pitch that never begins with the word I. That's all I've got for you today. And uh, I'll turn it back to uh, Alice or whoever for uh, any questions and answers that you might have. Well, I, maybe you've got the answers. I, or man, I've got the questions. I don't know. Thank you so much. Is this, is this on? OK. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you to, to Matt. Um, I want to reiterate that the recordings we saw were role-playing exercises. The research that Matt was describing was not his own personal. In fact, I think it was made up um, for the purpose of illustrating um, in this conversation. Um, we, will, we are open now to taking questions from the attendees, if you'll enter them in the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, and I would like to start with a question for Paul. Um, and that is that, You've described sort of the um, a general rule of, of what drives journalists and, and media representatives, but we know that there is a spectrum of them. Some are more interested in understanding than others. Um, and how would you recommend that we figure out who's who and and adjust our responses accordingly? Yeah, Alice, uh, one of the techniques I've been interviewed many times, and here's a quick technique. Uh, can you hear me? Are we good? Uh, one, of the, one of the techniques that I use is before an interview begins, I'll just simply ask the reporter, so tell me, what's your interest in this, uh, in this subject? Uh, they will disclose some hints, and, and that's off the record. That's just before, hey, what's your interest? Um, what what made this story sound compelling to you? Uh, and they might show their hand a little bit there. So that's one thing that I'd recommend uh, that you do. If you know the interview's coming up and typically you do, uh, you can ask in advance, you know, what are the questions you plan to ask me? They may not tell you. Uh, obviously, if it's the Journal of New England Medicine Science, you know, if it's JAMA, if it's something like that, uh, you're, you're you're probably in safe spot. But if it's if it's a mass media interview, uh, find out what their questions are, if they'll tell you. Uh, and then, you know, if you've got somebody in your communication shop or you work, your public affairs shop, they're obviously going to do a little bit of research to find out if that organization has done previous stories and what was their angle. Hi, Paul. I have one from um, the audience. Can a question at the start of the of your elevator pitch help to get engagement? So starting with a question. Oh, absolutely. If it's provocative, um, absolutely. And especially if it's a question that they're going to want to answer. And if you're not ready with an elevator pitch, uh, you know, obviously you're you're looking at a rhetorical question because you don't want them to interject or there goes your elevator pitch. Um, but the question at the start of a, of my elevator pitch, if I was a researcher, might be, do you have family members who have suffered from diseases? Uh, do you do you have loved ones that have already passed on? Clearly, almost all of us have experienced those kinds of losses. So yeah, it, as long as you're you're moving quickly so that they don't inter you know respond with an answer um, themselves. It's a rhetorical setup. It's a great technique asking a question that you really are not looking for an answer to, but asking a question that's going to hit them uh, emotionally uh, is great.
Okay. Uh, I was looking in the wrong spot, but it was still a good question. Sorry. When we deflect questions, wouldn't that be viewed as something negative, possibly leaving the audience asking the question, you really didn't answer my question. What are you hiding? Yeah, you're, you're now talking about a press conference. It's a little harder to do. Uh, but if you're talking about a interview with a newspaper reporter or somebody else, um, they can air your entire quote or they can print your entire quote. Uh, so it can't be completely off subject, but it doesn't need to respond directly. Uh, again, you've got your own talking points and you are not required to answer anybody's question exactly as they framed it. You are the one being interviewed. You are the subject. And, uh, you know, right now we have a lot of people that don't respond fully because of intellectual property. And, uh, you know, I, I use that as a fallback, just as uh, so many people coming to uh, public parties uh, are using COVID now as, oh, I can't come. I've got COVID. And everybody goes, oh, OK, well, I understand that. You can't come, of course. Um, but I, I think uh, intellectual property can also be one of our pivots of why we can't really fully go into that. Um, so I'm worried about um, misleading people by being as succinct as you're recommending. I mean, science is in itself a nuanced um, proposition. And so, you know, if we tell them, well, there's this horrible problem and we're solving it, that can get people than to be disappointed if they have that problem tomorrow and the doctor can't fix it right away. Um, how do you deal with the need for nuance when time is so limited? Yeah, Alice, uh, that question is accurate on so many levels. Um, I have a great friend with a glioblastoma. I'm frustrated. Y'all have been working on, on cancers for how many years? Why is it still about a one-year death sentence? I'm frustrated as the general public. Um, on the other hand, uh, this friend of mine with the glio has gotten a new immunotherapy and now has almost come back to life. The tumor's still there and we're making progress. So what used to be for sure about a 12 month sentence is now turning into we're at 15 months. That's amazing progress. But yeah, I'm frustrated. Y'all have been doing research on these things for decades. And as the general public, we get frustrated the moment it hits one of our families. You know, we might be completely um, disinterested in biomedical research until my son has that condition or my neighbor has that condition or my mother has that condition. And so the challenge, as you, the first part of the question kind of stated, is we don't want to mislead anybody. Well, the problem really is, is that scientists want to tell the whole story. They want to read you the entire thing. And this is one of the reasons that there's a disconnect between the scientific community and the general public is because in my opinion, and this might be controversial, in my opinion, scientists historically have had difficulty communicating succinctly because they want to tell the whole picture because the whole picture is the science. Unfortunately, the public doesn't have the attention span for the meal that you want to serve. We're looking for appetizers and that makes it real difficult. I get it. I totally get it. There are other places for you to put the white papers, to have the technical discussions, to paint the entire picture. But oftentimes, that is not palatable to the general public. I wish it were different, but it's not. 
So would it be would useful, useful to say to say something, um, uh, sort of acknowledge the frustration that we are frustrated to? This is the direction we're heading. Would that be? Would that give us the end enough to be reasonable without promising falsely? Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I mean, that goes back to the first thing about style is when we're communicating from our personality. I mean, I, a, a prestigious uh, cancer researcher who gets a Nobel is equally as frustrated when his or her family member gets the same cancer. We are at our basic level, we're all people. We all have personalities. We all have hurts and wants and needs and desires and dreams and goals. We're the same. Your audience is, uh, your community is much more educated than my community. I can't possibly understand all of the things that you know and, and what you're looking for when you're doing research. But at the most common level, we're still people. We fall down, we get hurt. We cut our finger when we're slicing onions, it bleeds. So to whatever degree we can communicate with each other about science in using our personalities, you will then connect with us. You'll connect. But the temptation, because you know the, the importance of having the whole picture, the temptation is you're going to try to tell me everything and then get frustrated with me because I didn't get it. And the reason I didn't get it is my attention spans eight seconds. Somebody else has got a different message for me about football. Somebody else has got a different message for the stock market today. Somebody else has a different message for what's going on in Israel and Gaza. You're competing. And what you want to do is to give me a taste so that I will want a little bit more. I can't tell you how many times I've watched a movie uh, that just really grabbed me and I turn around and Google it uh, so that I can get more information because it was based on a true story. Uh, that's really what we're after with the public and with the media is we want to just get that little hook in there and then give them enough reason to go get some more information. And if they want to read the white paper, great. If they want to go to JAMA, great. Thank you, Paul. Um, Sally, you have a question? Um, yeah, hi, um, Paul, this is Sally thompson -Tani. I did have a question. Um, one of the things I kind of share Alice's concern that, you know, maybe some of us, when we're hearing some of these messages, we're thinking, you know, that may feel unauthentic to us. And how do we make sure that our messaging is succinct and authentic to our personalities, as you're mentioning? Um, and then, you know, to this eight seconds, I I would say mine might not even be eight seconds, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But that's also maybe why that, you know, those information sources are those those social media, those very brief digestible things that even though we don't trust it, they're so accessible to us. So dealing with making these succinct messages accessible, but also feeling authentic and truthful to us. Yeah, I, I you know, I would never put authenticity at risk. You, you want to be authentic. You want to be genuine. You want to be truthful. There's no question about that. Um, to give you an example, when I was in Afghanistan, um, uh, I was the public affairs trainer to the Afghan National Army, and I was called on quite often when difficult subjects came up. And uh, one in particular, uh, we had two helicopters flying over a mountain, and they came down, and they looked down, and they saw uh, what appeared to be 15 members of the Taliban uh, with rifles pointing up at the helicopter, and they quickly responded uh, and began firing. Well, it was 15 little boys out gathering woods, like little boys do, and they were playing like they're shooting down the helicopters. We saw the same thing happen with Israel and Gaza the other day, with three of the hostages with white flags waving, and yet they were still shot. So I have never advised anybody to be unauthentic. I've never advised anybody to not tell the truth. Uh, the importance is to be concise without explaining too much 
of what is not going to be captured by the public. Those were negative examples. The positive examples is, you know, you, you, you might be tempted to respond with a five minute answer so that you can be completely authentic. You can be completely genuine. At least in the words, uh, in the world of media, you're going to get about an eight second soundbite. So as you formulate your answers, as you formulate your um, elevator pitch, you want to think in terms of eight seconds of authenticity that is also at a language level with visual words that pulls your audience in for more. You're trying to win more seconds from somebody. Uh, but authenticity, being genuine, being truthful, being honest, absolutely all the time. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, so we have a question from the attendees, um, which is, is there a place in an interview on whatever your expertise is to clear up misconceptions that are not have not been directly asked by the reporter, but are important for the message? Oh, yeah, I think that's great. That would be the pivot. So if, if, if a reporter asks you one thing, uh, you see this in White House briefings all the time where the president will then pivot and say, hey, let me clear this up because there's the, there's a there's a misconception out there, misperception of what really is going on. And then you acknowledge the first part of the question and then pivot to answer and clear up whatever you think is there. So absolutely, I think that's a, that's a, a powerful technique. And I, I don't know if Matt is on the line, but he may have uh, some thoughts on that as well, uh, having done the role play with me. Yeah, I, I, go ahead, Matt. Sure, I, I am here. And one of the things that I struggled with actually was trying to find a way to use something other than that's a good question as my pivot. It felt inauthentic to keep referring to that. And so that's something that I'm gonna take away from this uh, is, is being able to uh, you know practice, practice, practice and think about uh, how to be authentic um, and sound natural and let my personality come to the fore when I'm making that kind of a pivot. Yeah, and, and Matt, your personality wins the day. Uh, you did not come across as being inapproachable. Uh, you had energy in your voice. You had all those kinds of things. So I'm already captivated by the person that I'm interviewing. Um, and, you know, again, when we did the second role play, Matt, your second answer was nine words, and it was guaranteed, if not in the headline, it was guaranteed, guaranteed to be the soundbite. And so, you know, back to Sally's question, it's not about uh, being inauthentic. It's about putting together a power line just electrified in as few words and as few syllables, because scientists love multisyllabic words, uh, but, but in all that essence that captures my attention. Yeah. Paul, we have another question. I am struggling, sorry, I am struggling with the use of the term general public. How do we create succinct messages when there is such a diverse array of beliefs, attitudes, knowledges, identities, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, we used to have a, how should we say it, a more predictable general public. Uh, now you're president of the United States if you can get 48% of the general public to pull the lever on your behalf. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the foundation of the question is actually very, very correct. Um, but we all, in the general public, we all have shared experiences. All of us. We all have lost a loved one to disease, to tragedy. All of us, that's 100% of the general public. And so that's when I say, let's go to the shared experiences to start our answers. Because then we loop in 
100% of the general public. I think, I think that's an excellent point. I don't have any questions here. Is there anybody present at the round table who would like to ask Paul a question? Okay, yes. Introduce yourself and I'm not sure if they, Paul could see you or not. Go from there. Hi Paul, um, this is Nicole Navratil. And um, my question is how can we, um, how can we take control with the media so that we're not, um, we're not waiting for them to come to us, but we're actually seeking out those interviews and seeking out um, the ability to tell our stories. Can you give us just a little insight on, on how we can be more proactive about that? Sure. Um, again, number one, you have to begin with the end. So the only way that you're going to capture um, the attention of the media is with a condition that their audience experiences. So they're not interested about what you're doing in your lab. They're interested in what the audience is dealing with. I did a TV show um, that focused on research being done at University of Minnesota with uh, dogs that were dealing with the same kind of glial glioblastomas that, that humans were. And you know, I've got a golden retriever. So many of you have pets. Uh, we typically love our pets, perhaps more than we love some of our friends, family, and neighbors, but that's beside the point. And we, you will grab my attention if you mention a condition of my pet and how what you're doing in a laboratory setting in research is going to help my pet. Uh, same thing if it's, if it's about a loved one. Uh, but you're right there. The, the ways we've got to do that, I mean, obviously, you can do the press releases. If you send a press release to the local TV station, it's not an event that they need to cover. They put it on a different board so that if it's a slow news day, they might send a beat reporter out there to do an interview. And if you do that, and I talked with Matt about this, your institution needs to have B-roll unless you're planning to take somebody down with a camera into your vivarium and to see what's going on. So absolutely every institution, organization, corporation needs to have approved vetted B-roll so that a story can take place. So if you're talking about a newspaper, they got to have a photograph they can use. Um, the beauty of that is you choose what they're going to see in the B-roll. And trust me, you know, I've done 360 of these speeches across the country uh, when I was running the foundation. Uh, and there are a lot of institutions that said, oh no, you're not getting any B-roll from my facility. Uh, well, then good luck, uh, because then the B-roll will be whatever people have in their own imagination. And that will be, of course, the images that PETA has shown for years. Or, uh, any other of the animal rights organizations. Uh, so, yeah, you, I mean, you, you try the press releases. Uh, you can make phone calls. Uh, the, everybody's looking for news. Um, and, in fact, uh, you can also create your own and distribute it over. Um, I, I was chatting with uh, trying to mentor, actually, a vet tech who had tremendous research with uh, rabbits and and uh, encouraged her to write a story and get it placed. And the problem was she wrote an 8,712 word story. And when the editor of the magazine said, we love this, but we've got to cut it down. And she said, absolutely not. The whole story has to be told. Fantastic research, fantastic story, very well written and never published. Great. Um, I have one question for Matt. I'm assuming you're still there. Um, and that is, when you were doing these conversations with Paul, what did you find surprisingly difficult to deal with? Was it, I mean, I imagine there must have been something. Um, or if there wasn't anything surprising, at least what was the most difficult thing? Um, and what, do you have any thoughts about how to better prepare for that in the future? 
Yeah, clearly for me, the most difficult part was not knowing what where he was going to go and what he was going to ask. Um, I spent the better part of a week even knowing that he was going to be a friendly person. <laughs> um, <laughs> sitting here going, oh my gosh, what's he going to ask me about? And uh, I think that um, Pablo's mentioning that you should uh, have uh, maybe a start the, the interview with saying, well, what are, bef what is your, what's your interest in this? or trying to get some more information about where they're coming from um, can be very helpful in sort of settling down your nerves and getting ready to, to go into that. Because I, I think it is, it's, it can be a nerve wracking thing. Um, and I, I wanna pivot. I had a question for, for Pablo, if you don't mind. Um, you've said not to start out your elevator speech with the term I. One of the techniques that I have heard people use is to, to personalize why you're doing the research that you're doing. Um, it, it would seem that those two things are somewhat in, in conflict. How, how would you bridge the two? Oh, man, I agree. Um, I'm just saying, go to your personal experience after you pull their personal experience mm -hmm. into the chat. Um, so have you ever had some who is suffering from cancer. I have a friend who's uh, dying of glioblastoma right now, and we're yep. trying to work on and so forth. Yeah, something like exactly. That. Just start, always start with them before you go to you. Okay. Well, great. Thank you both so much for participating in this session. Um, we really appreciate the insights that you've brought to us and demonstrated for us um, the that, that I think we will close this session now um, 